Good evening. I'm Lois Reitzes. Delighted to be here with you for this special event honoring the opening of the Alliance Theater's new production of A Christmas Carol. In her typically eloquent and elegant way, Alliance Artistic Director Susan Booth said, during the last two years, we've all learned new patterns, some by choice, some by necessity. And in the midst of all that has changed, many of us have come to treasure more than ever that which stayed the same. For this year's production of The Christmas Carol, while the set is new and the direction is new, the story is one we know and love. And there is something that feels so right about that. To return to the unknown, to return to the known with the shared realities that have changed us. And together again to listen to a familiar story. Gathering with me now and all of you are the director, Leora Morris, and set designer, Todd Rosenthal. So great to talk with you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. After 31 seasons, the Alliance continues this beloved holiday tradition with new elements. Leora, what can you tell us about this adaptation by David H. Bell? There's so much to tell. Um, what really I find so striking about this adaptation is that David is acutely focused on the idea of family and community. And what does it mean to belong to a family and how are we accountable to the communities around us? And where do we belong? And so while the tale is certainly the same tale of a, a man, Ebenezer Scrooge, who comes to face his past and reckon with his present and make choices about his future, he's situated in this community of folks that David has really amplified not only the Cratchit family, who we all know and love, um, Bob, who works for Scrooge, but also some of the uh, fruit sellers who go to Scrooge for loans and his domestic staff and his nephew and his family. And we've really turned the dial up on the, the people that surround Scrooge that he's disconnected from, that he's missing out on who he's living alongside, but not in relationship with. And so as he has the, the magical transformation that we all wait for in this play, I think, he returns to this world alive and enlivened and determined to enliven and to give and to lead with compassion and with curiosity and to be different, even if he has no idea how to start doing that but a sweet family and a little boy, a little character named Tiny Tim help him toward that. They do, they do. And I think in this production, something I find really special is that I've been saying in some other productions, Ebenezer Scrooge is afraid of dying and it's seeing his own death and his own mortality that is what transforms him. And in this production, he starts out being afraid of living and it is getting to know Tiny Tim and the idea that he could have helped or could help this young boy that is what transforms him and sends him reoriented out into the world. Not his own death, not his own legacy. It is the desire to serve. Oh, so beautiful. Todd, you are a glittering star in the firmament of set designs <laughs> with awards, awards including a Tony and Olivier and a lengthy list of other distinguished prizes that would take up most of the time we have. So I've got to tell you, it's, it's just so exciting 
to have you here and to see this magnificent design. Um, I know you're also a professor at Northwestern University. Did you know Susan Booth and her husband, Max Leventhal, when they were in Chicago? I did. I, I first met Max when he was the production manager at the Goodman. And Susan was also working in the, at the Goodman. Yes. Um, and our first regional theater production outside of Chicago, Susan and I, was at the Alliance. It was Beast on the Moon, and we did it in the Hertz. And I can't remember the date. As often, I often don't remember the dates, but I, that was like 20 years ago or so. so. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think many of us are curious about the process of design. When, when you create a set, do you work with the director in the theater company or are you an artist alone in a studio and then the director and the team come to that set after it's created? No, definitely. I, I usually work in real close collaboration with the, with the director. In this particular case, Lior is the third director in this process. We started this, the design process six years ago, was it? Around six yeah. years ago, maybe more, seven years ago. And I remember Susan called me and she said, you're probably going to say no, but I'd love for you to design our new Christmas card. I said, I would love to do it. Oh. You know, it's a story about it's never too late to change. And we can always use stories like that oh. about that. So um, so in this case, the design... The design was mostly complete when Leora came on board, which is which is an, an anomaly. That's not usually the way it happens. Um, so she was very patient, and she had some things that she, you know, if we could have gone back, I think the set would have been drastically different. But she did inherit that set, and we tried to make as many accommodations as we could, um, because you know it is it's the director's the boss. You know, they're the ones who invite me to the party, <laughs> um, and in this case, it was kind of reversed. So, well. Um, Looking at this set transports us to Victorian London, to Charles Dickens setting for this story with gorgeous detail. I mean, the wallpaper, the clock, St. Paul's in the background. And I was hoping you could describe the architectural design and the appearance of this set for radio listeners, as well as viewers who may not be able to see the detail. Yeah, and it's all all constructed by hand. And and one of the one of the benefits of one of the very few benefits of COVID was that they actually were able they had a lot of time to to construct the set and to paint the set, and they could they could um, um, they they didn't have to work on a number of other different shows, so they could really just focus on this. Um, so we were really able to, um, to, to uh, they were really able to, to accommodate a lot of the detail in, in the design. And I can only imagine the engineering involved. I mean, this, this is architecture and it revolves. And it's engineering. And, and what the challenge of doing a Christmas Carol is there's so many different scenes and there's so many different requirements. And you not only need to figure out what each one of these um, different sets looks like, but you need to you need to have a, 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 a method of moving from one scene to another that doesn't slow down the production. And the way what I tell my students is the way something moves is just as important as the way it looks. And so it needs to have you need to be able to talk thematically about how a set moves. And so we wanted this 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 whimsical, beautiful, detailed Victorian town that could spin and change and evolve. And and we also have other elements that come in from the sides, and so it's constantly in motion. Mm. So. And and Leora, would you talk about getting the actors comfortable with all the movement and revolving? Yeah, I mean, it, we, it was a very fun rehearsal hall because we were all always trying to wrap our brains around, you know, are we going this way or this way? And people would be shuffling off to the side and we'd be trying to imagine it because the rehearsal room just cannot emulate the dimension and the movement that Todd has built and is describing. Um, 
So we looked in a lot of detail at the plan. So anytime we would be working on a given scene, we would take a look at the ground plan and really understand what am I seeing? What's behind me? What does this entrance feel like? What is this door made of? And think through the behavior of that space. How does that space teach me about the way this family lives, their morning routine, their nighttime routine, how they get dressed? How can we kind of source that from this space that Todd has given us and the textures and the materials and um, the tone of the world? Mm. Would you take us through the new costumes? I, I'd i love to hear about their design. And it's so much fun to think about, again, Victorian era dress. Sure. You want me to start that? And sure. Jumping. You were there more for the beginning of that than I was. What but uh, yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so I mean, we are really in mid 19th century London is our kind of contemporary moment. but we get to go back into the past with Scrooge's memory to his childhood and then to his adolescence and his young adulthood. So we get to go all the way back to the 1830s, even late 1820s and get some silhouettes from earlier. And then as we progress into the ghost of Christmas future, we start to see some silhouettes of the yet to come times. Um, so all of the costumes have been designed by our wonderful designer, Marianne. They too have exquisite amounts of detail. Um, and she has such, paid such tremendous attention to color and how color mm. builds these worlds and the warmth of the Cratchit family and the cold of the London streets on a foggy day, um, really alive in her choices, especially up against Todd's scenic world. Yeah, because looking at that wallpaper could be William Morris or would he be too late for that, that strictly Victorian era wallpaper? Yeah, and, 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 and this one of the scenes that takes place in this particular set, she wanted, in, in some instances, she wants the actress to pop against the set and sometimes she wants the actress to feel like they're part of the set and there's a beautiful scene um, later in the play where they look like they're part of that. They're all totally in the same world, which I think is really, really successful. Yeah. And as, as if there isn't enough to consider in intricate detail with everything you've been telling us, puppets are in this production. Where, where do the puppets come in? They're part of, I mean, disrupting the the civic space and adding the magic and the mystery. So all of our spirits, Jacob Marley, the ghost of Jacob Marley and the ghost of Christmas past, present and future show up and change the world with some magic in slightly different ways. Um, but as we were thinking through how we wanted to do that in this world within this kind of gesture, uh, it started to feel like we needed some I was going to say extraterrestrial help, but that's not <laughs> quite right. But we needed the the breath and the spirit of of a puppet to to come in and be uh, otherworldly enough to really rattle Scrooge and treat the audience to something from just a different world. This is the first time Andrew Benader, a favorite Atlanta actor, will play the role of Scrooge, which I think must be on the bucket list of many actors. Although Andrew has been in A Christmas Carol before as Jacob Marley, what perspective does he bring to this portrayal of Scrooge? Oh, I can't wait to ask audiences that who see the show actually. Um, I mean, Andrew is such an such an intelligent actor and uh what i appreciate so much about him is his sense of play and so even when scrooge is intentionally unintentionally cruel perhaps or or causing harm to people in the beginning it's all coming from this real need to outwit or to write people's hypocrisies or expose their misunderstandings with such a a passion for winning. It's such a game. There's so much pleasure in it. And over the course of the show, 
we see him redirect that sense of play towards good. And so, but you can feel it from the beginning. You can feel the effervescence for lack of a better word in this moment. And by the, by the time we get to the end and he's using that towards delighting people rather than causing suffering, it's, um, it just feels like a coming home. Mm. And he's such a clown. Yes, he's a wonderful yeah. actor. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about the cast, if you will. The cast is tremendous. I mean, it is a, a fully Atlanta-based cast, and it is such a celebration of the homegrown talent of this city. Um, I mean, I there's 20 of them, and I could talk for 20 minutes about each of them. Um, but what I think really unites everyone in this project as a cast is both a commitment to the kind of joy that's necessary in this act of service of telling this story to the community, especially right now when we need connection so much, and also a real devotion to building characters that are authentic and real and grounded and rich. Mm. 12 year old Chloe Gia Bremer is portraying Tiny Tim. She's the third female actor to play this role. Why was gender not a factor in casting here? I think we were looking for the spirit, the spirit of that child, the person who whose smile makes you want to do better for the future and for the kids that are going to inherit the planet. Um, and there's, Tim needs, in the text, in Dickens' text, in David's text, Tim is able to meet his circumstance with such tremendous grace. And so we were looking for someone who, who both could light your heart up and also be the child in the room teaching the adults about how to face difficulty with that kind of grace. And we saw it in Chloe and we didn't really need a boy, we just needed Chloe. Mm. Americans love Victorian England and we tend to romanticize the era. In fact, Dickens was disgusted with the social conditions, the horrid working conditions of the time. In what ways does this new production allow an audience in 2021 to draw some parallels with the message of A Christmas Carol? I mean, I think it lays bare the injustices and inequalities of Victorian London in a way that we cannot help but see as a reflection of our contemporary moment. And there are moments in the show, there are images in the show, there is language in the show around the welfare of and common good and income and um, incarceration and how hamstrung the poor are by loans. And, you know, there's, David has honored Dickens, but really brought our ear into 21st century Atlanta, I would say. And that's reflected in our cast and, and in the text as well. So what you're saying really brings home all the more why it was important to have this new production, this new approach to a classic and yet preserve the integrity of the original. I was wondering, Todd, do you have something like postpartum depression when a run ends and a set comes down? No, not at all. I actually really love that it's an ephemeral thing. And, um, you know, I, I at one point wanted to be an architect, and I, I don't think I could ever stand having a building outlast me. <laughs> so, so here I was uh, thinking. Okay. And this is going to come back. So, okay. Um, yeah. So, yes, it, it lives on. It will live on. And, and I think that that's, um, um, it's resourceful. 
Um, and I, and it will continue to evolve, which I think is great. And um, it's uh, um, we'll look at the production this year, and and we'll, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll make some modifications to it, to the design and to the way that it's staged, you know, because you really don't know what the, something is until you actually see it. Um, and there's always going to be some surprises. So, well. It has been fascinating going behind the curtain with you both, although fortunately the curtain isn't down on this gorgeous set. Todd Rosenthal, Leora Morris, thank you so very much. Thank you, Lois. Thank you. And wishing you the happiest holidays imaginable, which I think could be enhanced by seeing the Alliance Theatre's production of The Christmas Carol. Thank you for joining us.